save your recording regularly, closing the tab will lose the audio unless you save it. So I will not close that tab. Good idea. <laughs> All right, here we go. Ra, ra. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to another episode of Secret Level, a Geek Tyrant production. I am your host, Joey Parr, editor-in-chief of GeekTyrant.com, and joining me is the great and fabulous Billy Fisher. Yay! The one awesome. person in the crowd. Yes, I'm and very it's, excited. And it's Billy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Here we are again, episode four. What do we got in store for them today? Well, you know, we started a conversation about poltergeists in our very first episode. Yep. And we knew we were eventually going to get around to making a poltergeist episode. And we just thought, you know what? Hey, let's make our poltergeist episode. Right. <laughs> so here we are. So this is... This new episode of Secret Level is going to focus on poltergeist. We are digging into the unknown facts. Well, I don't know. Maybe some people will know them. Right. But I mean, it's still just, fun to talk about. Just trivia, little things that you might not know about. Put it all in one little convenient package for everybody. Exactly. And then, you know, you, know, you have our lovely voices spitting it at you. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I mean, because technically that's how people, that's want, that's how people want their, their podcast. Just spat through, at them. Just spat at them. I'm down. Let's do it. Okay. Excellent. So yeah, Poltergeist. Great film. Scary film. Still scary. Super today. scary for a PG movie. Right. It's, I think... It took this watching for me to get a lot of the nuances that are in it. So we're going to be talking about that too. There's certain things that because I was so enthralled with the story, I didn't pick up little things. So I'm really excited to talk about that kind of stuff. When was the last time you watched this movie before? Uh, the last yeah. time I watched this movie was with you before I moved to Arizona. Whoa. That's yeah, a long time ago. I've probably long watched time it ago. four or five times since then. I, yes, I, I love I, watching Poltergeist. It's one of those movies I just put on to put on sometimes. Uh, the last time I watched it, I showed it to my kids for the first time. Uh -huh. And it scared the shit out of them. And, and see, that's the issue is that everybody in my family, I, I love scary movies. You know that I love scary movies. That was one of our biggest things, going out and watching the new scary movie. Yep. No one in my family likes scary movies. Yeah. But I, sh I show them signs and they all ran out of the living room <laughs> in fear. The so thing I, is, poltergeist. and I felt it was okay to show my kids this one. Right. They're, I think when I showed it to them, they were, one was 11 and one was 14. Mm -hmm. And it's PG. Right. So they should be able to watch it without any problems, right? You would think so. They you loved it, so. though. While they were scared, they did enjoy it. And they frequently asked me to put it on. Which is... So, when I put it on this last time before the podcast, they all, like, gathered around the TV to watch and enjoy, so... That'd be sweet. I had to hide and I, watch it by myself. I love that my kids like Poltergeist. <laughs> right? That's awesome. Because <laughs> when I was a kid, I, I grew up on, enjoying horror movies. And... I think Poltergeist was one of the first horror movies I saw that really kind of like messed me up a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, for several reasons. You know, people tearing their faces off and little girls Skeletons being kidnapped coming out and of the ground. pulled into TVs and right. parents having to rush in and rescue them. Oh, dude. In... This time I actually put it in perspective of a parent, like what the the mindset of the parents must have been while all of this crap was going down. And I think it made it even worse. Yeah. Like, but even scarier. Before we kind of start digging into it, before we like Absolutely. dive into the poltergeist of greatness, mm -hmm. what is something new you came across this week that you want to talk about? Okay. You already know this and I'm sure you're sick and tired of hearing it from me. But I started a new book series this week called The Murderbot Diaries by Martha Wells. And it's yes. fantastic. I mean, you, 
we always get sci-fi movies from the perspective of either the bad guy or the good guy. We never get it from the perspective of the robot sidekick in the movie yeah. and what's going on in their head while stupid humans are running around doing dumb things and they're trying to figure out why that's going on. It's, it's, it's a series of short stories. There's five so far. There's going to be six. I'm on number four. It hasn't lost its edge. It's still fun. I really recommend it. It's definitely something worth checking out. So what about you, Joe? What have you experienced this week? Oh man, you know what I'm going through. You're probably sick and tired of hearing me talk about St. Elsewhere. No, I know it gets so much better. I'm really excited for this. Well, I've been watching St. Elsewhere all this week. Mm -hmm. And in my time watching it, Polly Shore shored up. Sure, that, yeah. was, that was interesting. William Sadler. Was really? There. Yeah. I was very surprised to see, oh, okay. see William in there. Mm -hmm. One of the Dr. Seuss books, If I Ran the Zoo, was made an appearance, which is now a banned Dr. Seuss book. <laughs> Dang, that's true. Yeah. So that was that was kind of interesting because it kind of talked about a little bit about the story and stuff. And in the 80s, If I Ran a Zoo and the hospital kind of being like a zoo, kind of, you know, stuff like that. Right, but right. It, anyway. It, there was an interesting scene where you have surgeons and nurses in an operating room and they're all naked performing an operation completely in the nude. Well, of course, why not? <laughs> I mean, I prefer that when I'm this getting surgeries, really, that everyone it's, is naked. It's like, okay, this is getting weird. This is getting, what is happening? What <laughs> is this? There was an episode where one of the doctors uh, has a gun in his room uh -huh. and like his, his home and he's okay. got a little kid and he tries to hide the gun and he hides it between the cushions of his bed, but, okay. but he's, the handle's like completely sticking out so the kid can come in and like swap out his toy gun and put his toy gun under the bed and then put the real gun in his holster. Yeah. I'm like, okay, they're they're gonna go with you know the classic guns are bad story, right? Yes. And it 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 really had an interesting twist because it their home was invaded by someone that came mm -hmm. in to basically be rape the the doctor and the the wife. Like there's some weird stuff go on. Like he was ready to do some bad stuff. Mm -hmm. And the kid walks in with his cowboy outfit and the intruder like looks at him and is like, starts playing like guns with him, like out of, you know, sticks his gun at the kid. Right. And so the kid takes out his gun and shoots him dead. <laughs> and I was like, amazing. <laughs> well, I mean, at least they went original on that one. I know. <laughs> with a completely opposite direction with that. Absolutely. I was like all like worried, like, oh man, they're going to show the kid like shoot himself and I'm just going to be like in a bummer mood the rest of the night. And then he ends up pulling his gun out, shooting the people, terrorizing his parents. I'm like, good for that kid. <laughs> you know, that would be a banned show now. Oh yeah, for sure. So. For sure. <laughs> it was interesting though, but I have some interesting news, Billy. Oh. Please hit me with it. Today, I oh. was watching it, and all of a sudden, the characters just start leaving the show and dying off. I came to the last episode. Yes. I made it. Yes. It was the autistic kid the whole time. <laughs> his it was mind. Head. Yep. The whole thing he made up in his head. Yep. The whole show. Every character, every weird. I was like, episode. it automatically, you know, at what point there was a cut and uh -huh. then it would, we were in this living room and the people I thought were doctors were, uh, were the kid's grandpa and dad. Mm -hmm. And he's just kind of sitting there staring at a snow globe. With a hospital in it. And it was interesting because the way they did it is. They had a shot of the hospital and the hospital starts shaking and then immediately cuts to the kid shaking the snow globe uh -huh. with the hospital in it. And I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I have so many thoughts now 
because everything that was juvenile about the show, mm-hmm. a lot of that stuff now makes sense of why it was so insane. Yes. But at the same time, I'm thinking, man, this kid, knowing all this stuff that he does, he's got to be pretty smart to like come up with these complex stories. Right. And he had to organize it and remember everybody that was involved in the situation. So it was, it was interesting. I can't say I hated the ending because it actually made the series make sense a little bit more for, for right. certain aspects. But at the same time, like I said before, this kid, man, he's super freaking smart and should be writing scripts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and then we got St. Elsewhere. So maybe it's based on a true story. It was, it was interesting, though. That was definitely an interesting watch. Yeah. I, I'm but I finished with it. Four episodes in. You don't have to hear me talk about it anymore. I'm done with St. Elsewhere. Fantastic. I'm just glad you made it through. Um, Until we do an episode where we go behind the scenes and find all the trivia of St. Elsewhere. Which would be cool. <laughs> and that's, I, I would love to do that down the line just because of the, all of the main, all these guys that are actors that have made it in Hollywood started off there, especially Denzel Washington. That's just crazy to me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but yeah, I mean, it's. Well, it is character. He just quit being a doctor at the end. Like, I'm done being a doctor. Right. You spent. How many years tried to like be a doctor and you just had to up and quit? That's but it. again, this isn't a kid's mind, right? So right, right. anything can happen. Right. Well, yeah, the kid doesn't know how an adult would quit a job or why an adult would quit a job. He was just like, yeah, we're done with him. So, so yep, awesome. staying elsewhere. There you go. I'm done. It's in the can. It's in the can. Oh, man, cool. I'm so glad. I, I kept waiting. And then we talked about things like, Time Bandits, where everything could have been a dream. And I was like, see it elsewhere. And then, but, yeah. But, it, like, but it's not a dream. And so now I think, look back at that Cheers episode, and maybe he, the kid was just watching Cheers. Watching one Cheers. Day, yeah. One day. I wanted to like, say that. I almost did. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. So he's watching Cheers, and he thought, oh, it'd be cool if my dad and my grandpa went into Cheers, right? Yeah. Look. That's so cool. I'm so glad you, you finished it. Well, good. Now we got I just to find a new project. I just don't know how this kid knows all everything about the medical industry and, and the politics of it and all that stuff. Well, there's an episode where he's in the hospital. But so is, I'm thinking maybe he was in the hospital, in and out of the hospital a lot, and that was his experience listening to what they said. Oh, uh, maybe. And just brought it to life into his active imagination. Maybe. Yeah. We're, L- we're lots real of, deep into like, it. I literally finished it about two hours ago, so I'm still right. just kind of digesting it. Yeah, right, right. It, maybe new information will come out next time and we'll we'll bring it up. But first, so, we got to get to... Yeah, let, uh, let's get on to some Poltergeist, Poltergeist talk. Yeah. So I'm going to start off with the synopsis for the okay. film, just to, yep. just to get us going. Strange and creepy happenings beset an average California family. The Freelings... Steve, Diane, Dana, and eight-year-old Robbie, and five-year-old Carol Ann would ghost commune with them through the television set. Initially friendly and playful, the spirit stirred unexpectedly menacing, and when Carol Ann goes missing, Steve and Diane turn to parapsychologist and eventually an exorcist for help. Yeah, um... It's very light on details. Yeah, I was going to say, they, they really glazed over that one. They just, I like how they just get into it. Like, very first scene. Well. They just get right into it. Let's talk about the very first scene. There's a guy on a mm. BMX bike riding through the neighborhood. Yeah. A 40-year-old dad, right? you know, some middle-aged dad riding through the neighborhood. This isn't the BMX bike boys from E.T. No, This no. is the middle-aged dad. Riding with a case of beers and and kids are chasing him with their remote control cars down the street and they make him crash. I just thought that was funny. It, well, okay, and that, so that's I, not going to make BMX any money, but you know, no, it was no, still it was still it a fun little scene. So okay, so I've always seen that scene and I never thought anything of it, but then I realized later that when they're they're showing an exterior shot of the scene, that bike is Robbie's. So. That dude was at the house 
jumped on Robbie's bike, <laughs> took off, got his beer and tried to get back. I was like, well, I mean, I guess he's not drunk driving at that point. I, I don't know. I don't know what the point of that was, but it was still fun to know that it wasn't even his bike. He just that, grabbed some random kid's bike. That's awesome. Bike. Yeah. I did catch that little detail. <laughs> so we're going to talk about some stuff, little known stuff, and we're going to talk about some of our favorite scenes. Why don't you hit us with some of those lesser known facts about Poltergeist? Well, Steven Spielberg, and this is one of the few films that Steven Spielberg is actually credited with writing. Spielberg doesn't really write his own stuff. So this is one of those rare movies where you get to see Spielberg write. Yeah. And he wrote an 11 page idea called Nighttime in the 80s. And he actually wanted Stephen King to come in and write the script for it. So Nighttime was poltergeist and Stephen King was wanted for the script to like finish off the idea. But right. apparently Stephen King wanted too much money to do the job. So it wasn't used. He didn't, he didn't jump on board the project. Which is interesting because I can't help but think what this movie would have been like had Stephen King written it. Right. And we're talking 80 Stephen King. So off the rails, Stephen off King. Off the rails, Stephen King. Yeah. yeah. And that would have been, I just can't help but think it would have been something completely and totally different on every level. Right. But, yeah. and I would have loved to see that movie, but I am so completely happy and <laughs> grateful for what we got. Because right, absolutely. Poltergeist is a beautifully made film. It is a, it's a beautiful film that tells a beautiful story about this, fa- this close-knit family that is trying to save their daughter from the netherworld. <laughs> right. And there's, there's sweet moments in it where you, there's emotion and then there are absolutely completely terrifying moments where some people that don't like horror movies would just shit their pants. Right. And what surprised me on this viewing is that there's a lot more comedy than I previously realized. Like there's more subtle lines slipped in there that are secretly hilarious or little scenes that I wasn't paying that much attention to before because of the the drama was so high and then all of a sudden you see something and you're like, oh, that's, I mean, I think it's just keep it a little bit more lighthearted so you don't absolutely lose your mind and go batshit crazy. <laughs> so what was his inspiration for Nighttime, which eventually became... Uh... Oh, okay, okay. So yeah, the inspiration for the movie comes from an actual experience that happened in Denver, Colorado in the late 1800s. When Denver was expanding, there was a graveyard where the city government wanted to put in kind of a big park, like kind of like Central Park in New York, but in Colorado. And they put out notices for bids to relocate the cemetery. And they decided to go with the lowest bidder. About a third way through the project, Mm -hmm. the contractor realized that he had seriously underbid the job. And he basically just... Move the headstones. He didn't remove any of the bodies or any, any of the coffins or whatever. He just decided, you know, it's going to be a lot cheaper for me to move the headstones. What a creep. He completed the job and the city started building a structure on the park. And as it was close to getting finished, one of the contractor's employees spilled the beans and told them what the contractor had done with the headstones and that the bodies were still buried there. Contractor ended up being arrested, but the damage was done. The city, not being able to afford to tear down the building and dig up the cemetery, left it as is. They left the bodies there, and they finished the project with all the bodies still buried, leaving (laughs) leaving the unmarked graves as they were. If you ever want to visit, the park is named Chessman Park, and the graves sit under the Greek pavilion on the east side of the park. It extends south to 8th Avenue. That's so creepy, That's dude. just crazy. What a jerk. It's funny because I watch a lot of these ghost adventure shows, you know, ghost hunters, ghost adventures, these like, those kind of shows. Right. I, none of them have ever 
talked about this or have gone to this park. Road trip. See, it seems like to be the first place that they'd want to go. Right, right. Seems like a cool a lot kind of paranormal that. activity. I'm already scared. That's not going. <laughs> but yeah, so that's the inspiration behind the story because in the film, uh, it's not a park. They build houses over the cemetery yeah, right. and the contractor yeah. of the houses just remove the headstones and not the bodies. Anything which that, led some, suck. which led to some insane sequences at the end of the movie. Yeah. I mean, you had coffins and dead people blowing up out of the ground during a rainstorm. <laughs> yes. I yeah, that we definitely have to get into it because there's some stuff with that that makes it even creepier, but we'll yeah, yeah. in a little bit. Like seriously, I, I don't know how their minds just didn't melt at that point. Cause they kind of did though. They kind of did because you remember Craig T. Nelson was talking with the contractor, well, yelling at the contractor, saying, You only moved the headstones! You only moved the headstones and left the bodies! Yes. <laughs> and the contractor lets out that crazy that yell. Crazy, crazy blood curdling scream. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Yeah. That was great. That guy's toast. Yeah. I've he sat there for the rest of the time. I love that scene, though. When I watched it this last time, I was just like, man, that's just, I love everything about that. Dude, and and the best part is that contractor guy just stands in that spot. Like, crap is hitting him in the face. Bodies are popping up out of the ground around him, and he just stands there because His what brain else is, he is melting, do? dude. His yeah. brain is literally melting. <laughs> He's like, I shouldn't have got out of bed this morning. That's it. Yeah, it was that whole scene. If you're taking it from a reality standpoint, that guy is reacting like I would at that point. Yeah. So Steven Spielberg actually originally wanted to direct this movie. And oh. he wanted Toby Hooper to direct E.T. And he offered Hooper the E.T. script. Mm -hmm. Hooper declined, said no. So Spielberg was like, well, like, oh, I kind of want to work with the guy anyway. So he gave him the treatment for Poltergeist. And he's like, oh, yeah, that's the one I want to do. But then in the end, wasn't it Spielberg that really directed the film, Billy? I mean, yes. Toby Hooper's name is on there credited he, as he is. He the is. director. But yes, if you've seen Jaws, if you've seen E.T., if you've seen any of Spielberg's movies, it's drawn out just like that. He knows exactly where to slow it down and draw out the tension and then hit you in the face. But man, this movie has Spielberg written all over the place. Uh -huh. In every scene, it's like a Spielberg shot. So he must have had, I know he scripted the whole thing, but he right. also must have had complete storyboards of everything and this movie was shot before et so spielberg was working on et while this movie was in production and spielberg was on set every day of the, the shooting of this movie i think oh yeah uh, well i mean isn't kind of the rule in hollywood you can't be shooting Two films simultaneously. Yeah, like, so yeah, so yeah, so that's exactly. Yeah, Spielberg would have directed both, but you, yeah, there's that rule. So, so Toby Hooper was just kind of the placeholder. Spielberg knew the vision he wanted to take, mm -hmm. and was just very hands on with it. Oh yeah, but it ended up being a fantastic movie. So I mean, either way, whoever directed it, Spielberg, Hooper, Spielberg, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure George Lucas might have had a hand, hand or two in it because, you know, one couldn't go out without the other at that time period. So so the actress who played the medium in the movie Zelda, mm -hmm. Rubenstein, yes. she was quoted as saying she was on the shoot for six days and she said Spielberg was the director and Toby Hooper couldn't direct traffic. Like it was too overwhelming for him? I don't know. 
She mm. that's what she said though. Oh, wow. and ET, the extraterrestrial and poltergeist, they were only filmed 20 minutes away from each other. Oh, uh, see? Uh, it's all coming together now. When questioned about who had greater control over the film, Spielberg, Spielberg was asked this question, and he said, Toby isn't a take charge sort of guy. If a question was asked and an answer wasn't immediately forthcoming, I jumped in and say what we could do. Toby would nod in agreement, and that became the process of their collaboration. Huh. Okay, that explains a lot. Uh, Frank Marshall talked about the movie and said the creative force behind the movie was Steven. Toby was the director and was on set every day, but Steven did the design for every storyboard and was only absent three days during the entire shoot because he was in Hawaii with George Lucas for those three days. Okay. Hooper, Hooper then later claimed that he did half of the storyboards. Spielberg then sent a letter to Hooper to clarify the matters, saying, Re Regrettably, some of the press has misunderstood the rather unique creative relationship that you and I shared throughout the making of Poltergeist. I enjoyed your openness in allowing me, as a writer and a producer, a wide berth for creative involvement. Just as I know you are happy with the freedom you had to direct Pol Poltergeist so wonderfully. Through the screenplay, you accepted a vision of this very intense movie from the start. And as the director, you delivered the goods. You performed responsibly and professionally throughout. And I wish you great success on your next project. I mean, I don't know. That kind of seems like tongue in cheek a little bit. Yeah. I think yeah. he's being very diplomatic. Yes. He's, he, he's he, not there to make waves, but he's there to make a point. Right. You better recognize who really did this shit or yep. else. I got you. So it's up to people to decide, but, you know, while Hooper was on the set every day and he is the credited director of the film, I'll 100% give him that. Right. But Spielberg, I do 100% believe that he was the driving creative force behind it and that he was more directing... Hooper to direct Poltergeist. Right. So he was like the, the earpiece. He'd, Spielberg would tell him, Hey, this is what I want. And Hooper would just do it. Yeah. Okay. I can see that. Yeah. Uh, another thing that Zelda said that while Hooper set up the shots, Spielberg would make adjustments. And in regards to meeting him for her audition, she said if Hooper was only partially there. So, so Spielberg was the one choosing the actors. Yeah. Setting up the scenes. Spielberg was the guy behind the movie. Gotcha. So. And that makes sense. But they all did work on the screenplay together. Uh, Toby Hooper, Steven Spielberg, and the other screenwriters. They all worked together on that script. And in an early draft of the script, mm -hmm. Carol Ann was originally supposed to be killed in the first act of the film. Holy crap. And then she was going to haunt the house in the second act. Okay. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that would, it's a weird element. It would have been cool, but it's a little dark. You could still see it in there in a way. Right. They eventually decided that that was way too dark and opted to have her kidnapped by the ghosts. Okay. So that's pretty much what happened. Eventually, Which, uh, it's... That almost seems creepier, though. Though I mean, that seems a little bit more ominous because it does. being being dead and being a ghost, yeah, that's scary. But being captured by ghosts and being held against your will in a realm, and like they say in the movies, most of them were benevolent ghosts. They didn't know they were dead, but just that one jerk that comes in and makes everything scary. That just makes it worse. Yeah. And now listen to this. So okay, there was there were a lot of dark elements originally in the movie and Spielberg mm. had them removed because he wanted the movie to be PG so that the film could run as a double feature in theaters with the ET when it was released. So they want, he wanted Poltergeist and hit uh. ET to run in theaters at the same time. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that's a rough one. Which one do you play first? And so do you what, go with and look what he did though. Look at the movie. There's only one death in the film. 
uh-huh. and it's Tweety the Bird. <laughs> That's because everybody else is dead before the movie started. And then there's just only a few injuries throughout the film. Right. But, right. but look at the film, dude. We just watched it. Look how dark and creepy that movie is. That is 100% bona fide horror in every way. Not only horror like messing with your mind horror, but visual horror, blood and and guts as well. Right? Right. Well, and that's the thing is uh, in this showing, I was watching it and I was like, because I remember Robbie getting eaten by the tree, but things happen so fast. He's eaten by the tree. The next thing you know, Carol Ann's missing. So they don't really have time to comfort the poor kid who is just, ripped out of his room by a tree started getting eaten craig t nelson saves them. they follow the tree next thing you know they're looking for carol ann and poor robbie's wandering around the house going yeah freaking wrong dude eat. i i know that like the focus is on carol ann most of the time because she was kidnapped but dude i i do feel bad for robbie dude yeah I, okay, he was so he was kind of tortured he was, but I think it actually... He's always tortured. He was tortured in the second film, too. With the braces. With the braces. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Robbie's but... ruined forever. <laughs> you didn't really see him out that much after that. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. So, yeah, it was dark. It's just one bad thing after another for that poor family. And it's, it's, and it's funny because, you know, we talk about that that darkness and, and how crazy it is. And even though Spielberg took out all these other scenes that he wanted to include because they were too scary, mm-hmm. the film as is was originally given an R rating, but Spielberg and the other filmmakers protested and ended up getting a PG rating on that thing. I don't know how they did it, but they did it. And at the time, this was, this was at a time where PG 13 did not exist as a rating. Right. I'm it, it was either PG or R. The fact that they got this at the PG, wow. Just based on one scene alone, I'm surprised it got a PG rating because the parents in the beginning of the movie are rolling up dudes in the bed. They're smoking weed just right there, token up. It was the 80s, and, dude. It didn't matter. The 80s. That's right. But I mean, kids are going to be like, hey, mom, hey, dad, what the heck are those guys doing? And they're just going to be like, we're, they're doing what we, we do every night. When you walk in on us, that's, that's what we're doing. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Oh, that, man. That's, just, that's what the parents are going to tell the kids. Right. They're just going to be like, hey, mom, dad, that's what you do. <laughs> oh, kids, they love to rat out their parents. That's <laughs> awesome. So I'm just telling you right now, Carol Ann is one of the, she's a little girl so I don't want to say creepy but she's one of the creepiest characters of any horror film just the voice not I wouldn't say she's creepy she's she's got a sweet vibe to her but but she says everything with a smile on her face like why she just watches that spirit go above her head into the wall and wouldn't her, you when you were a kid Billy wouldn't she smile. just be like wow wow there's you see the that air. Because they don't know any better. They're little kids. That's what makes it creepy. Okay. Yeah, they don't see the, the, they don't, they don't have the experience to know that that's not supposed to happen. Did you know that uh, Drew Barrymore originally auditioned for the role of Carol Ann? I didn't know that. Yeah. That's cool. She originally auditioned for the part. Spielberg loved her and was Uh, like, you know what? I want this kid for E.T. So much and, better. In- and she, so Spielberg, so Spielberg held off and she didn't get the part in Poltergeist, but she ended up in E.T. So her audition for Poltergeist landed her the role in E.T., which I thought was, was pretty awesome. Yeah, that is cool. And, I mean, and oh, go ahead. perfect as Gertie. Oh, oh yeah. No, Drew Barrymore is great in that film. Spielberg spotted Heather O'Rourke having lunch with her mother at an MGM commissary. And from with the minute he saw her, he's like, I need her in this movie. So he basically made it his personal mission to cast her. 
So they set up the audition. She goes into her first audition for the first time and she bombs it. <laughs> she just laughed through the whole, basically she kept laughing through her audition and Spielberg was like, oh crap, maybe she's too young to take a screen test seriously kind of thing. Right. But he saw something in her mm-hmm. and ended up giving her another chance. And at the mm-hmm. next audition, Heather had to scream, which she did until she cried. So she screamed until she cried. And Spielberg's like, you got the job, kid. Yeah. she And you know what? That's the thing. That's what makes it so creepy is that she's so innocent looking, so sweet. She's got such a nice voice. So to hear her in distress in the movie just makes it worse. Just makes the whole movie. It takes it to another level of creepy because you don't want anything to happen to her. You want her yeah, to survive. As you having daughters, me having daughters, the thought of something happening to them is devastating. Right. And when I watched this film before I was a parent, Mm -hmm. it was just a great horror film. And it was like cool to see a little girl kidnapped by ghosts and stuff like that. Right. Yep. I watch it as an adult and I get more emotional when I watch it now because I'm like, Oh my gosh, what these parents would have to go through is just completely heartbreaking and just hard on every level because their scenes in the film where they're completely just broken down, right? Right. And they're just like, you know, when they bring in the the parapsychologists and stuff, and they, the group of mm-hmm. ghosts, the ghost hunters. By the way, first time ghost hunters are ever, I think, really used in a film like that. Like this kind of right. put what ghost hunters on the map in a way. Right. I mean, you had the, you had the, I believe it was Laurel and Hardy did it. A, a crack on ghost hunting at one point, but this is the first time they're actually taken seriously and used as a serious device in a movie. Yeah. As opposed to something funny or to bring laughs. Yeah. But you know, when they bring in the parapsychologist, they're just like, yeah, everything's just broke right now. Our family's just broken. Right. You know, all the supernatural stuff takes, uh, takes a whole, like, it means nothing to them like it does the paranormal paranormal group, right? They're right. just like, I remember, you know, like the the one guy, he said, he talked about how it's like, I watched a toy roll across the floor. I have it on time lapse camera and I shot it over the course of seven days or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, oh, seven days, huh? Oh, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> and then he <laughs> opens the door to the bedroom and every, like all the toys and stuff every, flying around the room is just good. You know, la- the, the evil laughter and stuff. This is great. Yep. Yeah. And they're just sitting there with their jaws drop. The oh, classic yeah, Spielberg then, zoom in shot on the faces. Right, right, right. Realizing that, oh shit, we're in over our heads on this one. Yep. So with speaking of Heather O'Rourke, like there's a lot of backstory with both of the daughters in the movie yes yeah, so had rough lives after after this movie yes yeah, so o'rourke was kind of on her way of becoming a big star she got her sh- first shot on happy days mm-hmm. and then she got this and then everyone wanted the caster and stuff after poltergeist because you know look at her obviously because of her performance and she she ended up making three of the Poltergeist films before she ended up uh, passing away due to congenital bowel obstruction. That's awful, man. Uh, but isn't that, that kind of what started the whole? No, actually, not that. There were there were the, 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 Dana's the, death. the Poltergeist curse, right? Yeah. So that's yeah. There's that whole thing with the Poltergeist curse. So the girl who played the 60 year old daughter in the film. Dominique Dunn. Dominique Dunn. Yeah, she died in 1982, the same year that the movie was released. She was strangled to death by her boyfriend, who... Right. Yeah. She was only 22 at the time. Yeah, so she was strangled to death. That's just... is 
crazy. Again, she was an up and coming star with a bright future ahead of her. And because of some asshole, her life was cut short. Right. And both, That's... and both, yeah, both uh, Dominic Dunn and Heather O'Rourke are in the same cemetery together, Westwood Memorial Park in Los Angeles. Man. Yeah. I mean, they both, even though uh, Dominique Dunn's not in it as much as everybody else, her performance in that, like, she'd always have to go from zero to 60, you know, in all of her scenes. Yep. Because she'd have to walk into the craziness. Like, she went from asleep to everything's floating around a room or Carol Ann's missing. Like, she always had to be ramped up. So it's just, it's just sad. They both were great actresses in their time. It's just sad they had to go so early. Yeah. It's interesting because Joe Beth Williams was also having supernatural experiences during the making of the film. It's said that whenever she came home from filming, the pictures on the walls of her house uh -huh. were crooked. And she would fix them. But whenever she came back from shooting, they were crooked again. That's one of her claims. That's crazy. Yeah, a lot of people say that when they're filming horror movies, like something gets in. Like there's always, with every horror movie, there's some kind of weird uh, occurrence that happens with cast members or crew. It, yep. it's, I, I wouldn't, I'm not surprised that it happened with this one. Also, Zelda, who played the medium in the movie, she had an experience when a vision of her dog came to her and said goodbye to her. Mm hmm Hours later, her mother called and told her that her dog had passed away that very day. Yeah. So that's, that's an experience that, that she has shared. That's crazy. So, you know, some crazy things happened during the shooting of the movie. And again, it's, the, it's called the poltergeist curse. Right. It's one of those urban legends. I mean, and I can see how people can come to that conclusion, but you know, shit happens. You know, it just sucks that it happened in, to the people that were filming that movie. And it's, and it's believed by many, there's a reason why people believe that bad things happened during this movie, which we will get into later. Nice. So talking about strange occurrences in this movie. It's full of them. Full of them. I had to rewind one scene about five times, and then I had to call you to make sure that I was seeing what I was seeing. Yeah, you Because it made no sense. Because you were watching it on HBO Max, right? Right, I so was you, watching that. So you thought it was just like a weird thing. That maybe right, I thought it was- the, It was just on uh, the streaming service. Right, I thought it was the, like, yeah, everybody knows uh, McClunky from Star Wars. They added that in on Disney+. Plus. So I thought this was a scene cut by HBO for the streaming service, because Diane's sitting there talking about the sliding chair through the kitchen and Caroline sliding and they're talking and then all of a sudden mid sentence, it cuts to them at the neighbor's house. And I was like, what the, what did I miss something? Was like, was there like inappropriate language or something too much? Was it too much for HBO max? Yeah. And so I funny. called you and I was like, yeah. And I'm uh, like, oh yeah. Man. Yeah. I, that is in the actual real cut of the movie and has always been in the cut. There's just this hard cut right in the middle of a sentence. And they end up, like you said, they end up at the Davers house. The reason for the cut was because of the original scene. Steven says how he hates Pizza Hut, the dad. Right, right, right. It's not like yeah, Pizza Hut. Yeah, because they were talking Hut. about going to Pizza Hut yep. after they got done with the chair. Okay. And Pizza Hut took offense at it. Uh-huh. And so they decided to cut that out because Pizza Hut took an offense. Pizza Hut was offended. They didn't want to offend Pizza Hut. It, what's funny is Pizza Hut couldn't sue Spielberg or anything for saying their pizza sucks because, right. one, it's a first bed issue. Yeah. And Pizza Hut, they, they, they weren't involved with the movie. Like, it wasn't like they were a sponsor. <laughs> they weren't, they, they did, there was no product placement. It was just a Pizza Hut. They, a, a, line of, just wanted, a line of Pizza Hut sucks. Uh, so they just have to cut the, they just have to cut the scene. Right. It's interesting that they did though, because they didn't want to offend Pizza Hut. Like, and it's such a jarring cut, dude. It just. And like, I wouldn't even care. I'm like, so well, what they think Pizza Hut does suck. That's why I put it in the script. 
Honestly, uh, I don't know anyone that likes Pizza Hut. Should we cut this out? We keep saying Pizza Hut sucks. I'm not cutting Yeah, it. we should cut that out. <laughs> Pizza Hut's <laughs> going to come after us and sue us for telling. And we want them to like us just in case they want to advertise on our, our podcast. But I do want to bring up the part where you, like, when they first find out something strange is happening in their house when things are sliding across the floor, right? Mm-hmm. They, they, that you see the chair slides across the kitchen floor. Then they put Carol Ann down in the circle and she slides across the floor and they explain how there's like a tickle inside. Right. We're in the mid. Before they're pulled. And the yeah, dad's just like that there scene with, and then they cut. Yeah. And the dad's just sitting there with like a blank stare on his face. Like, right. Wait, this just isn't computing. I don't understand what is happening. I don't understand anything right now because this just makes no sense. And then they're at the neighbors and the neighbors eating a plate full of beans. But I want to ask you. Yes. If that happened, would you Mm -hmm. allow yourself to be pulled across the room like that? Would you allow your kids to be pulled across the room like that? I'm just, I'm curious. Not my kids. I might do it. I definitely do. Because I'm, I'm. I would have to experience that. Right. (laughs) But. I don't know. I don't know if I'd let my kids do it, but I, I mean, at that point they didn't think it was, uh, they didn't think it was malicious. They didn't think it was a, exactly. a force that was. Evil. Exactly. So, so think of it as like, if you're in the same mindset. Right. Then, I mean, at that point, yes, but seeing how things escalated from there, <laughs> maybe it wasn't the best idea. Yeah. I'm sure but, if they would have seen the movie. Yeah. Before they done the experience, they would have been like, uh, uh-uh, uh, no. Watch Poltergeist. I've Poltergeist. done. Kids, get out of here. We're moving out. Selling the house. We're leaving now. Yeah. That was that was fun. There's there but there's a lot of things in there. Like, number one, I would have never there's two things I would have never done that are in that movie. Okay. Number one, that clown would have never been in my house. Serious shit. I've, dude, that, that have clown. Have you ever been to my mom's house? I have. You I know, have. she's got her creepy clowns and marionette dolls. Yep, it's some kind places. of. She's not, she's not like a crazed collector, but she's got some creepy stuff in there. It's enough to creep me out. Yes. I. That's not allowed in my house, and I don't feel it should be allowed in anyone else's house. It's just not, it's not cool. And number two is that tree. That, Dude, that, but isn't that tree like a perfect setting for a graveyard? Yes, you would find that in a graveyard, not in my backyard. But still, it used to be a graveyard, so it's per- it, it makes perfect sense yeah, that tree would sense. be there, that creepy-ass yes. tree, because there was a graveyard there, and all graveyards need creepy-ass trees. Man, that thing would have been gone before I moved in there, though. I would have <laughs> taken that thing out. That, there's no reason for that to be there. But yes. But, but speaking of the clowns and the, and the creepy tree, those were based on uh, very real fears experienced by Spielberg himself when he was a kid. Really? Yeah, he was terrified of he was terrified of clowns, and he was terrified. Apparently, he was terrified by trees as well, or, or creepy graveyard trees. Right? <laughs> Stupid graveyard trees. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I feel his pain on that one because that, that's just, every time I watch that movie, that's my first instinct to cut that freaking tree down. It has no business there. Yeah, but one other thing I wanted to talk about before the the clowns and the creepy trees. That shot of the chairs, that crazy balancing the, shot the, of the pyramid of the chairs. The pyramid of chairs, yeah. Yeah. So that was actually all done in camera. Like as they were shooting and it pans away, a bunch of guys came in and put all the chairs together and then ran off a screen when it panned back. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing because that, that chair pyramid looks so hard to put up. Seven seconds. They had to do it in seven seconds. That's that's a, those guys deserve some kind of credit or an award for that because that's that's crazy cool. Yeah, but back to creepy clowns and creepy trees. Yes, Oliver Robbins, the kid who played Robbie in the film, Robbie. his son. Uh huh. He was almost strangled while shooting the clown strangling scene. Like he was almost strangled in real life. That does not help clowns at all. <laughs> that did, no, it does not help their cause. No. Neither do creepy clown hotels that exist. Good point. Yep. 
But, but so he almost got strangled by that? Yeah, so the equipment used to tie the clown's arms around Robbie's neck, uh-huh. they ended up becoming too tight, and it started to constrict on him for too long. Uh-huh. And Oliver kept screaming, I can't breathe, but Toby Hooper assumed he was just ad-living. He thought he was just acting. <laughs> He thought, oh, he's just doing some. Like he, that, you would he's just so. doing some improv right now. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't until Steven Spielberg basically noticed that Oliver was turning purple, <laughs> where he like that's a good pretty much dove in as the Steven Spielberg superhero to save the day. Like he's not acting. This kid's really being strangled right now. Oh man. Oh, we're going to hit on this point later, but it's a good thing that Spielberg was on set every day. <laughs> right. He's saving people's lives. He's making films and saving lives. That's what he does. Yeah. But he, yeah. So Oliver was genuinely struggling to breathe and could not get himself out of that. Man. So that was, yeah, that's, that's traumatizing. Dude, no joke. We'll have to do it. We'll have to see if there were any goofs, like, like not goofs, but. We'll have to see if there are any uh, crazy things like that with the braces seen for Poltergeist too. So is there any other accidents or any other scary things that happened on set to the kids? There is, yeah. Heather O'Rourke, there was a scene where she had to hold on to the bed headboard while the oh, yeah. wind machine was blowing toys into the closet behind her. That's a crazy scene. Yeah, and during the scene, the actress just broke just broke down she just completely fell apart it was just it, it was just too much for and uh spielberg again stepped in to stop everything I took her in his arms and basically said you don't have to do it again it's the last whatever take they were on was like that's the last time so barely that was like a pretty intense scene I'm i mean you watch it you, there's fear in her face yeah yeah. She is not having a fun time. <laughs> she is not having a good time in this. Because I was watching that today. I was like, how are they doing that? And you could tell she's struggling as hard as she can to hold on to that headboard. And it's l- wicker and it's literally just ripping apart in her hands as she's trying to hold on to it. I, I really wanted to, I want to see how they did that scene. But now that I hear that she was traumatized by it, I, I'm just going to leave that on alone. It must have been fun and hard to be on this film as as one of these kids right right because a lot of a lot of shit's going down that really messes with your psyche and you've got to be a good actor you've got to yeah. like show the fear in your face especially poor Ravi. oh the guy goes through so much crap in both movies <laughs> they kick his butt one thing that's always bought that that has bothered me but it kind of hit home for me today was okay so zelda rubenstein Yes. Plays Tangina in the movie. Yes. She's the exorcist. And she comes in and she's great. She's a great actress in this movie. This role was just built for her. My my mom knew her. No way. Yeah. My mom used Don't to work at a law years. firm and she was uh-huh. one of the clients, so she would come in. All the time. Uh, yeah, my mom says she was a very nice woman. Well, I mean, that's cool. She, I mean, she seems and like And my nice mom woman. being a fan of Poltergeist, I should, have right. asked, I should have asked my mom if she ever asked her to say, this house is clean. Freaking liar. <laughs> and Gina the liar. So, okay, she is actually probably one of the, has one of the funniest moments in the movie. They're, they're sitting at the portal and... And Diane, the mom, is like, okay, I'm going to go get my daughter. And Tangina goes, no, I'm going to go get her. You know, this is this is my scene. And Diane hits her with the, because uh, like, Tangina goes, you've never done this before. And Diane turns around and goes, well, neither have you. And you see it on Tangina's face. She's like, yeah, you're right. And then she turns around and says, you're right. You go in. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, you're right. You go. <laughs> I am not mentally ready for this so they go through all that you know what i mean they go through you know the mom goes in gets carol ann comes out the deed is done dude and then but but before we get to that point dude that giant freaking beast of a ghost monster with craig t nelson has got the rope and is holding on i promise i won't let go right 
Yeah, the face. And then that uh, giant ass creature comes out. He's like, Aah! and he lets go of the rope. The look on both of their faces is how I would have looked too, dude. I would. When we were talking yeah. about this earlier, you made a good point about. Uh, oh, the dad. Well, just... Craig T. Nelson. About, yeah, about Craig T. Nelson. Steve, if you want to call Steve. him. Steve. Dude, okay, for my whole life, I thought Steve was like the hero guy. He's the dad, right? He's the guy you look up to. Yeah, he was. But then I watched it this time about m- the second act. He's broken. Yeah. He's pretty much given up. There's no, like, he has no hope in this situation. Like, he goes and gets the parapsychologist, but that's the last, like, useful thing he does until the very end. You know what I mean? It's the mom. Diane is the true hero of this whole movie. Yeah. You know what I mean? She's the one that goes in and sacrifices herself to get the kid. Dude, and at the end, when, like, she's getting thrown all over the room, she never loses her shit. She, Dude, speaking of which, that scene is kind of terrifying. So scary. So like, dumb scary. I was like, yeah. man. It's, it's like, almost, watching it as an adult, as a kid, you're like, oh my gosh. Right. But as an adult, you're like, oh my gosh. Like, that's, that's brutal what is happening because sh- this woman is being attacked by a malevolent spirit. Right. That obviously is just... Wow. She's getting dragged all over the place, getting thrown out doors. She never loses her head, dude. She's on point the whole time. I'm getting my kids. I'm getting the hell out of here. That was another thing that bothered me. Why did they stay at that house while waiting for freaking Steve to come home? But look, the- but look at this real quick, though. And this is yeah. one thing I wanted to point out when you were talking about Tangina. Because uh-huh. she says the house is clean. Liar. And, and she leaves and everybody leaves and then they're like, oh, finally, good. It's all the house is clean. All right, let's back, pack. Everybody's let's, gonna be happy. Let's pack up and get out of here. And just when you think everything is all nice and wonderful, it just falls apart. Robbie gets attacked by a clown. Yeah. That's it's the second half where Robbie gets attacked by the clown. It's it's the second half where Yeah. Where, but dude, that little that little maniac, he's been through so much. He's tired of the shit. He rips that clown to pieces. I, know, he's like, dude. I ain't taking this from you anymore. He it's, hulks out on that thing. I love it. Dude, he's him and the mom, the true heroes of the story, man. They never give up. They're freaking fighting to the end. And after after the scene where she's dragged all across the room and on the walls and the ceiling and stuff. Right. And she goes running after her kids and just complete just everything. She's just drained of energy because of what is happening right now. Right. And I love that shot of her looking at her kid's doorway and the hallway just stretches. And she starts Freaking. running and it continues to stretch. And you're just like, oh, my gosh. Because that's what it would be like in real life if you were t- really trying to save your kid. It, you, you wouldn't be able to get enough. there fast enough. Oh, no. Yeah, definitely. Ugh. But she, she goes, that. M- I know we only see it once, but the monster that blocks her from the door. Yes. I just, gave, I just gave Billy a wide-eyed look. You, no yeah. one saw it. <laughs> but I, like, I shook my head. I had to say yes. yes to convey that. Monster, that. I, at that point, I give up. Yep, I'm done. That that thing comes popping out of me. Nope. Uh, this shit's gone to a level where I can't handle this. I'm I'm out of here. But no, she kept fighting, dude. She was all over that thing. Yeah. It's interesting, too, because, you know, Zelda, you know, said this house is clean. Apparently, in real life, she was a real medium and had psychic abilities. No way. Yeah. I believe that. Like, that's... Coming from her, I totally believe that. Well, I mean, she plays it so seriously, I wouldn't doubt it. I have no, you know, good for her, bringing it to Hollywood. Yep. So, yeah. um, One of the other scenes I wanted to talk about, though, was when the investigator goes into the bathroom. Oh, my God. And starts peeling his face off. Dude. Because that is hands down the the goriest most one of the goriest most disturbing scenes in the film for a PG film ever yes 
Like, it, it, like even this time, I couldn't even, like, sometimes I have to close my eyes and just let that scene pass because it looks, yes, you could tell it's fake, but the way it's happening looks so real and it's jarring. And you're just, you see the Ugh. face just coming off of his hands as he's tearing it off and then it cuts to the sink and the flesh and the, <laughs> and the muscle oh. just dropping into the sink with the, you're just oh, like, man. oh my gosh, this is so gross and so creepy ah stop it <laughs> it's it, uh, it, it's uh, interesting though because spielberg wanted to get that scene right uh spielberg spielberg wanted uh, not hooper spielberg wanted to get that scene right so spielberg yes. went in there and those are his hands in the scene he is the one that's pulling off the face in that scene because he wanted he just he wanted to look a certain way and he felt that his hands had the acting abilities to pull that off. Well, good for him. I hope he gets an Academy Award for his hands. <laughs> but yeah, that was that scene. Uh, it still haunts me. That's like one of the first things I think about when I think of Poltergeist is is the face ripping scene. The face and the meat crawling across the counter. Screw that! All because, the stuff that comes floating uh, out of it. Because I will tell you right now, Billy. Uh -huh. And yeah. those of you who are listening, I will tell yeah. you right now, ever since I saw that as a kid, I, mm -hmm. whenever I see a steak, mm -hmm. that immediately comes into my head. My whole life, I see a steak, and I can't help but think of that steak crawling across the kitchen counter and, and then the exploding with yeah. complete guts of grossness. So, and okay, that was gross. But for me, for some reason, the immediate cut scene to that leg of chicken that he was eating that he dropped on the ground. With the maggots on it? the maggots. You, that, you can't eat a chicken leg now without seeing maggots on it, can you? For a long time, I couldn't eat one because I thought that's going to have maggots in it. <laughs> Screw that. And like, my kids love eating chicken, so that's probably part of the reason why I won't show them this film because I don't want them to be ruined. For the rest of their lives. I don't feel like I'm ruined. I kind of like the fact that I always think about that scene <laughs> when I see a steak. Oh, man. that it, It's disturbing on so many levels. <laughs> um, okay. Speaking of creepy things that happen in the movie, like little details that you never caught before, you told me about this one before I watched it this time, and I saw it, and it... It hurt my feelings. It, <laughs> I was like, that's creepy, and I hate it. So when Diane is blowing her hair, this is when everybody thinks everything's good and happy and life's going to The house is clean. The house is Remember? clean. Uh, on the dresser in the background, there's a row of photographs of their family. Right. And after the cutaway to Robbie and the clown, Diane gets attacked. If you look closely at the photographs in the background, mm -hmm. the middle picture is of Carol Ann. But now it's not Carol Ann. In this scene, the picture of Carol Ann has changed into a demonic creature. And I had never noticed this until just recently. Ugh. And I was kind of blown away that I've watched this film so many times that I've never noticed that before. It's just a great little detail, a great little touch that after all these years is a newly found Easter egg for me that I'm truly happy I found because it just makes the movie so much better. It does. And it's those little touches, like I had never noticed it before, but once I noticed it this time, I was waiting for it, but it still caught me off guard. I was like, oh, ugh, that's not good, man. But. Once again, just reinforce, Tangina's a liar. The house is not clean. <laughs> she didn't know what she was doing. She didn't know what she was getting herself into. She didn't the know part. the power of the dark side. <laughs> right. Poltergeist. But they bring her back in the second one, right? Yeah. She did good her first time. She did better the second time. But yeah, no, dude, that was the picture thing. That was freaky. And before we go on to talking about something like kind of the highlight of this thing, I'm really excited to talk about because it's true. The rumors were true. Uh, 
All right, let's talk about Robbie's room. Okay. Because Robbie had a lot of cool stuff in his room. A lot of Star Wars stuff. Oh, it made me so jealous, dude. He had Han Solo's blaster. He, a couple of things in there I did have. And it made me sad when all the toys are falling into the closet. You see an original TIE fighter. It's like, no, that's a collector's item. And it bashes <laughs> into pieces. It was like, oh, dude, the pain. It's, it's funny, too, because I don't know if you noticed this, but Robbie also has a poster in his room for Super Bowl 22. Okay. But Super Bowl 22 wouldn't take place for another six years. Okay. When this movie was made. Uh I think it's weird and kind of fascinating that they put a Super Bowl 22 poster in a room when it was six years away. Right. I don't know the reason for that, but it's just got a a fun little, hey, did you know moment. Right. But there's a little more that goes with that one, right? What? The Super Bowl 22 poster. Is there? Yeah. So. Oh, you tell me then. Okay, so they say Super Bowl twenty two takes place six years later, right? Yeah. So Heather O'Rourke died in San Diego the day after Super Bowl Sunday in 1988, which was played in San Diego. Whoa. Yeah. I know it doesn't have much, but I just think it was kind of crazy that that's, you know. That's interesting. They, it came out in 82, Super Bowl Sunday, six years later. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yep. So just another little nail in the coffin of the, uh, the older guy's curse. Inappropriate, Billy. I'm sorry. Inappropriate. I had to go there. (laughs) Okay. Now. Now. Let's get to the rumor. Let's, let's. Okay. Set the record straight about the one long lasting rumor about older guy. I've been hearing this. For a long, you know, this is just one of those things that I've heard about when I was growing up. When I was a teenager, I heard about it. It was a doll I kept hearing about it. But the rumor was the skeletons used in the film at the very end mm-hmm. in the swimming pool. Uh, when Diane's in the swimming pool, the skeletons come floating up. And the skeletons mm-hmm. that are like exploding out of the ground and coffins opening and skeletons falling out. And just, it's just a mass one of the best spook alleys you've ever seen. Uh Uh-huh. Yes. Those skeletons were not fake. The rumor was they were real skeletons. And the fact is they were real skeletons, real human skeletons. That's messed up. Because it was cheaper and more cost-effective to use real skeletons at the time than plastic ones. How is that even possible? Yes, that is true. And Joe Beth Williams, who was the one in the water dealing with all this stuff, did not know any of this until Mm -hmm. after they had shot the scene. She did not know they were real skeletons. She did not know she was in a pool with real skeletons. I guess it's better for her not to know until it was done, but there's still no excuse. They should have, they should have warned everybody. It was the eighties, man. Yeah. They just did what they want. In an interview that aired on VH1 in 2002, Mm -hmm. they asked Williams about this. And she said, I would have to go in this huge tank of what I thought were mud with these skeletons, which, by the way, I thought they were plastic, but later found out they were real skeletons. And she says, it was a real nightmare. Of course it was. In another interview on the TV Land show... TV Land Myths and Legends in 2008, Mm -hmm. she expanded on that a bit saying, you have to understand that this sequence took probably four or five days to shoot. So I was in mud and goop all day, every day for like four or five days with skeletons all around me as I was screaming. In my innocence, I assumed that these were not real skeletons. I assumed that they were prop skeletons made out of plastic or rubber. I found out as did the whole crew that they were using real skeletons because it's far too expensive to make fake skeletons out of rubber. It's crazy. And then the complete confirmation came when special effects makeup artist Craig 
Reardon had to say under oath in a court of law that the skeletons used in the scene were real. In 1982, Reardon was deposed as part of a lawsuit filed against Spielberg by screenwriters Paul Clemens and Bennett Michael Yellen. The duo claimed that an Ambla employee acted as a ghost writer who took portions of their own script and submitted them to the Poltergeist production team as their own ideas. Clemens and Yellen's suit argued that there were 67 points of similarity between Spielberg's film and their own. So it's during this trial that he swore under oath saying, I acquired a number of actual biological surgical skeletons, is what they're called. They're for hanging at classrooms and study. These are actual skeletons from people. I think the bones are acquired from India, but at any rate, we got 13 of these and we dressed them so they looked not like bleached, clean, bolted together skeletons, but instead of disintegrating cadavers and, you know, added sculpted rubber and things to make them so they look like they had this kind of dramatic, leering, spooky aspect and not be dull. What I'm trying to say is clinical type corpses, you know, yeah. end quote. Gotcha. Williams also said that the use of the skeletons created such an unease around the Poltergeist set that it carried over into the making of the sequel, Poltergeist to the Other Side. She added that co-star Will Sampson, a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation, performed an exorcism on the set of the film. That was nice of him. It was. Yeah. But that's where people believe the poltergeist curse came from. The fact that they used actual skeletons, they think the curse came from that aspect of it. I gotcha. <laughs> The real bodies floating around in the, on the set. Yeah, I can see that. So yeah, that was, that was pretty crazy. During that scene as well that took place in that pool, Jo Beth Williams was terrified before she got into the pool. Before she knew that the skeletons were real, there was another reason why she was terrified. She's already creeped out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because of all the electrical quit equipment around, there were dangers that it would fall into the water, something would fall into the water and electric heater. That's a rational fear. Exactly. But to ease her mind, Steven Spielberg once again steps up to the plate and got into the pool with her, reassuring Williams that if anything happened, they would, they would both fry. <laughs> she got into the pool, they filmed the scene, she found out that there were actual skeletons instead of fake skeletons, and then all hell breaks loose. <laughs> well, there you go. I mean, he's there to help people, you know, overcome their fears and not get choked by clowns. <laughs> yeah, there's one thing that I want to talk about. I I told you this this movie's a lot more deceiving than it than it appears to be, and the one thing that gets me every time is the music. It's so happy and it's so good, <laughs> and then it changes tone in an instant to some of the scariest shit you've ever heard in your life. And sometimes the happy music makes it even more disturbing. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I, I love that about the musical score of this. The musical okay. score was done by Jerry Goldsmith. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote the music for Poltergeist. He also wrote the theme song to The Omen, which came out in 1976. And the omen got all kinds of praise from critics for being so dark and foreboding and evil and menacing and praising it for its demonic tone and stuff. Uh, mm. The poltergeist thing was criticized because it's, it was too, and I quote, Dis Disney fied. Uh -huh. And it's explained as because it bullied the audience into an inappropriately cheerful and family friendly state. Only to be, have their dash, their hopes and dreams just explode around them as the family I, just is attacked and terrorized by this evil poltergeist. I think it's genius. It definitely it is. It adds a level of horror to the film. It the does. cheerful and, music adds horror. And that's the thing too, is like because you want 
this family to be okay. And you love the happy moments. They seem like a really happy, fun family. But the score will change almost instantly when something weaves its way, something evil weaves its way into the family. And it's just, it takes on a whole different tone. Even though it's the same music, it's different. Yeah. And it makes you feel worse. So, I mean, good on them, dude. I mean, all of it worked. Yeah. Yeah. A couple other things I want to bring up before we close this out. Mm -hmm. The sound effect for the beast that attacks the house at the end of the movie is the source for the NGM lion roar. I heard that this time, dude. And I was like, no. I was like, no. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Yeah, you can definitely hear it. And why don't you tell them about the very, very end of the movie? Because most people don't stay through the credits. Okay, so today, I've never stayed through the credits because it it was before post-credit scenes. Yeah. You never get that. And so I got finished watching it. I had some laundry laying on the bed, so I start folding it up. And in the background, the the credits are rolling. And I'm just listening to the music, la, 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 la. Then all of a sudden, I hear the freaking creepiest laughs. Just in uh, layers and layers of creepy little kid and adult laughing that's the very end that's the that it's to me it could be the original post credit scene <laughs> but it gave me chills i thought i was dying it was everything that i everything <laughs> like, you where's that coming from where's that just, noise coming from i jumped what is happening <laughs> am i dying <laughs> exactly so definitely i mean I know it's not that big of a deal, but I mean, it, it is a post-credit scene, quote unquote. I mean, nothing, you never, I've never heard about it. It's nothing I've ever heard of before. And then it got me today and I was like, you know what? Uh, I'm probably never going to listen to that. So if you've never stayed to the credits of Poltergeist, next time you watch it, stick it's, to the credits. Enjoy yeah. some evil demonic laughing before <laughs> you go to bed. <laughs> oh, yeah. And before we end, I just want to leave you with a quote from the film. You're all familiar with the quote, they're here, but I want to leave you something with a little different this time. So this quote comes from Tangina in the film who says, you can't choose between life and death when you're dealing with what is in between. I like that quote. Yeah, that's a good one. That's why I'm sharing it. Made me happy. Something to be learned from it, right? Right. Yes, always. So there you go. That's my quote. Well, thank you guys for joining us in another episode. We get kind of get carried away, but we really appreciate you guys listening. It's it's a joy for us, and we want you guys to enjoy it as much as we do. Yeah, so if you like what you heard, like, subscribe, leave a review, make suggestions. We're open. We're curious. We'd love to hear what you got. But anyway, thank you for listening, everybody, and have a wonderful day or night, depending on when you're listening to this. Have a good one. Goodbye.